This is Ernest Shackleton. <clears throat> oh, sorry, Sir Ernest Shackleton. And I know what you're thinking. Why am I looking at a picture of Sir Ernest Shackleton when I clicked on a video about third man syndrome? Don't worry, I'll get to that eventually. So in 1914, Sir Ernest Shackleton and a bunch of other guys set off to cross Antarctica. The plan was to sail here, then walk across, carrying all their gear on sleds, then meet up with another ship here and sail away. Unfortunately, they ran into some problems when their ship got frozen into the ice on the way to Antarctica. Things got even worse when their ship was crushed by the ice pressure. This is about where their ship got frozen into the ice. They drifted along until about here, where their ship was crushed. They abandoned ship and had to set up camps on the ice where they continued to drift further. And right here is where the ice broke up and they had to get on board a few small boats they carried with them from the main ship. They sailed successfully to Elephant Island and touched dry land for the first time in months. Unfortunately, no one lived on the island that they had gone to. It was determined that Shackleton would have to go on to South Georgia Island where there is whaling communities in order to reach help. Shackleton and five crewmates set sail in a small sailboat called the James Caird, while the rest of the crew stayed on Elephant Island. For the next 15 days, these guys battled some of the stormiest oceans in the world, sometimes the winds reaching hurricane force, to get to the island. Because of the wind and waves, and because of the struggle they had already gone through, they decided to land on the south side of the island. In the process of landing on shore, they damaged the rudder on their sailboat. Because of this damage, they decided they couldn't put to sea again. It was decided that they would have to cross over land to get to the whaling community. There were a couple of problems with this plan, though. The interior of South Georgia Island looked like this. No one had ever crossed it before. It was unknown and uncharted. Also, this guy has probably the best pose in this entire video. Just wanted to point that out. The other problem is that they didn't have any hiking gear for this kind of trek. So they improvised by driving nails into their boots to give them extra traction and using a carpenter's ax in place of a traditional ice ax. Shackleton and two of his companions undertook this 26 mile or 40 kilometer journey over the mountains, through the island and to Stromness. And it was on this trip that Shackleton experienced third man syndrome. See, I told you we'd get back to it. But what is third man syndrome anyway? Third man syndrome happens to people when they're in very difficult situations. The person experiences the presence of somebody who isn't physically there. But instead of being scary, this presence often brings comfort, warmth, and strength to the person. The presence often gives suggestions or advice on how to survive the situation. Shackleton was exhausted, weak, and cold as he climbed over these mountains. This likely contributed to his experience of third man syndrome. Shackleton later wrote a book called South about his experiences. In the book he wrote, During that long and racking march of 36 hours over the unnamed mountains and glaciers of South Georgia, it seemed to me often that we were four, not three. Third man syndrome doesn't just happen to climbers and explorers either. It's happened to astronauts, underwater cave divers, miners trapped underground, survivors of terrorist attacks, pilots, and can happen to anyone else experiencing extreme survival situations. This is Charles Lindbergh. He's famous for flying from New York to Paris. And yes, lots of people fly from New York to Paris nowadays, so it doesn't seem like that big of a deal. But instead of the modern safe jets that we get to fly in, this guy had to fly in this. This plane had a single engine, no windshield, and a fixed landing gear that's just always hanging down on the way across the ocean. In May of 1927, Charles set out on his own from New York. He set a flight distance record at 3,600 miles or 5,800 kilometers and flew for 33 and a half hours before finally reaching Paris. Lindbergh only used an airspeed indicator and a compass to navigate on the way to Paris. He had to deal with ice building up on his wings and flying through fog and clouds and thunderstorms. He flew so low to the ocean at times that he could feel water coming off the waves splashing into his cockpit. And for the whole flight, he couldn't sleep or he would crash. After 22 hours of flight, Lindbergh felt that there was a presence with him in the fuselage of the aircraft. He felt the presence of multiple beings. He said, Without turning my head, I see them as clearly as in my normal field of vision. 
These presences didn't scare Lindbergh. He felt that they were familiar and helpful. They gave him advice on his flight. It was a very personal experience, and Lindbergh didn't speak of it publicly until 1953, when he wrote in a newspaper describing the forms as transparent in human outline. He said that the voices spoke with authority and clearness, but that he couldn't remember what they had said to him. In 1933, Frank Smythe almost became the first person to reach the summit of Mount Everest. He and his climbing partner had reached 27,400 feet, but were forced to camp there for two days before being able to continue due to bad weather. This was extremely dangerous because altitudes above 26,000 feet are considered the death zone, where humans can't survive for long periods of time. Once the weather had cleared, they were able to make their attempt to reach the summit. After climbing for a while, his partner was too weak to continue the climb. Continuing on his own, Smythe was able to get within 984 feet of the summit, before having to turn around due to lack of oxygen and exhaustion. As Smythe struggled back down the mountain, he stopped at a ledge and decided to eat something. He took out a Kendall mint cake that he had with him, broke it in half, and then offered half to the presence that he had felt with him for the last while. He had felt the presence of another person since leaving his climbing partner and continuing on his own. This presence kept him from feeling lonely, and he felt that he was tied to this presence by a rope and that the presence would save him if he were to slip. Smythe said that the feeling of the presence was so strong that when he went to give half of his cake to it, he was surprised that there was nobody there. This friendly, strong, and helpful presence only left Smythe when he came within sight of the camp. Based on the known examples of third man syndrome, it appears that the triggers for having this sort of experience are isolation, stress, fear, boredom, exhaustion, lack of sensory input, lack of oxygen, physical injury, and other moments of crisis. It seems like third man syndrome could be a fairly common experience. A study of 33 Spanish climbers who climb at over 24,000 feet found that one third of them had experienced hallucinations while climbing, and that one of the most common hallucinations was an imaginary presence. It could be that in stressful situations, the right side or creative side of the brain takes over from the left logical side and can cause hallucinations. It's comforting to know that in an extreme survival situation, there's a chance that you'll feel this third man syndrome, and it could bring you advice and a feeling of comfort. Thanks for watching. If you liked this video, please like and subscribe. If you want to learn more about the third man syndrome, you should read John Geiger's book, The Third Man Factor, Surviving the Impossible. It goes into way more depth than I was able to cover here. Thanks again and see you next time.